So we'll start with chapter one. We're going to go over chapter one. Again, the items I talk about, we'll see again. The items that I don't talk about, don't worry about. Now, chapter one and two are going to be a summary and a condensed version. At some level, um, the book has provided us with a lot of information about the history of um, various um, organizations. I'm not going to get caught up into that as much as we're going to get caught up into um, focus on the items that I find are of importance. <coughs> Thank God people need, yes. There's no, no homework. Class, There's no homework on chapters one and two, and we really won't be going over any problems on one and two. The solutions to all the questions are in the back of the book, are on Moodle for you. So really, primarily tonight is covering those chapters, and then we're going to call it good. Now next week, which we'll meet online, Prior to meeting online, you'll have the PowerPoint chapter three to go over. And I will have some problems, but then when we meet at, on WebEx, um, we'll continue to go over other problems for those who want to. Again, a lot of learning is to work through problems and understand why things are done the way they are. Now, thank God there is a need for financial accounting because that puts us all in business, right? In different forms, we are all here today and tentatively wanting to pursue accounting jobs because there is a huge need for financial accounting information. So we're going to talk about some of the reasons or demands upon the accounting industry or the need for accounting information. There are <coughs> forces that um, enhance demand. What are they? The first one you'll see here, various companies compete for lots of resources. They need money, capital, physical and natural resources, be it if, um, you know, the big um, North Dakota gas boom. What's happening here? They're needing fracking um, sand that they can, the fracking sand. <coughs> So they're all competing to find and to locate those natural resources. There's intellectual, intellectual property that is going to allow one company to um, prevail over another. Technology. How many of you guys have looked into the new iPhone? The six, is it iPhone 6? I wanted to get one in September until my husband said, you know what, we really need to be careful on any expenditures we just really don't need. So we'll see. I, I might need it though. <laughs> <coughs> but what allows Apple to surpass other Samsung and the Nokia, Nokia? What allows them to surpass their competitors? Innovation. Innovation costs money, doesn't it? It's um, individual capital, but it definitely helps put them um, in the billions of dollars. Skilled employees, executive customers, and suppliers. So there are all these various forces that are competing and fighting each other for the best, be it the best money, rates, um, goods, skill. And in addition to just these demands, there's also strategies. Companies need to have some form of a business plan that lists their goals and list their strategic method in which they're going to attain those goals. Now, doesn't always work, but they should have some edge or some leverage on their competitors to show how they are going to be better, be the best. 
provide the best product or the best service um, in comparison to their competitors. So we're all trying to buy for the market, okay? Remember back when a laptop cost 3,000 bucks? Now, I, my husband just got me a nice solid state Dell laptop, I don't know, touch screen. I think it's 1,400 bucks. Can you believe it? How come this technology is just improving rapidly and yet the price keeps going down? Supply and demand, isn't it? And ultimately, the competition has gotten really tough out there. And with a tougher competition, they're all trying to get a piece of the market. So there's definitely a lot of um, companies at play for a certain buck. <coughs> now, we have various activities. Now, you're going to look at this and remember a cash flow statement. Remember the cash flow statement? Businesses generally um, have three different types of activities they deal with. Financing activities, getting money. Um, they might raise money from an equity source such as stock. They might raise money from um, a bond source where they pay back um, those bonds. Investing activities. What type of investing activities are common within companies? What do they need to invest in? They need to invest in equipment, in buildings, property, um, intellectual property, any types of intangible properties. They need to use, have resources in which they can invest to build their business. And then lastly, the operating activities are really why the company is in business. So they need to have um, money to develop either the products, the technology, to create the goods or services that ultimately is sold. <coughs> Important, guys, do you hear when I say that? Important, you are aware that there are three distinct business activities. This should be a kind of a refresher from a principal's course, but know what the differences are. How financing is really to raise um, capital, be it equity or um, bonds, loans. Investing is really to assets or um, non-tangibles to expand the business, to grow the business, and then they need money for operating activities to produce the goods, to provide the services, to create the items that are for the competition. Three forms of activities, know that. Next, we're going to talk about stakeholders. Now, stakeholders are those individuals that have an interest in a company and especially in the financial situation of a company or the financial um, condition of a company. Some examples of stakeholders may be those investors, may be banks. Why would a bank be interested in the um, a company? They loan, them money. they loan them money. They have a big interest to make sure they're going to get paid back. How risky is this loan going to be? Is it fairly secure? Or do they need to worry about it? it you know, technically they're going to all rate the various potential of a default. So banks want to make sure this company is going to be a going concern. Right? Remember that word, going concern? The, in, the expectation of an entity is that it will remain a going concern. <coughs> now we've got creditors. It could be um, suppliers. Yes? So this lender must remain viable? Remain continuing. Continuing its operations indefinitely is the expectation of entities. A stakeholder also are the employees within the company. Now, in managerial accounting, that was primarily focused with providing financial statements for decision makers within a company so you could improve products, processes, ultimately 
get um, end up with better profits. A lot of these stakeholders we've looked at are external stakeholders, but internal um, stakeholders care. Why do we care? We want to make sure we have a job also, don't we? We want to know how the company's going, what changes are going to occur. We said suppliers, customers. Customers have an invested interest to, if they develop relationships, that these relationships will be in existence in the near future. Governmental authorities. Why are governmental authorities interested in the financial aspects of a company? For taxes? Why else? Regulations. So governmental plays various roles in monitoring if, they've, if they're subject to certain guidelines, inspections. Um, from a tax standpoint, it's based on those financial statements where ultimately the amount of tax they owe the federal or state government or uh, sales tax or whatever is um, constructed from. <coughs> and then we've got local communities. Now, we're not going to touch on this in this class, but we've heard of corporate social responsibility. And that's become a big push in the past decade where we're deciding or we're contemplating the fact that it's not just about profits that people need to be worried about. We need to make sure we provide back to the com community because ultimately, if we are good corporate citizens, the profits are going to come also. So they look at the corporate social responsibility as a manner in which to boost profits. Now, I don't know about you. I'm just going to be blunt with you, and you're going to probably roll your eyes and go, God, she's crazy. I am so sick and tired. I go through McDonald's, I, and I don't mind giving to the Ronald McDonald House because that's been around. But I go through Burger King. Would you like to donate a dollar to this entity. And then if I go into PetSmart, they're, they're wanting a dollar for another entity. Is there a place that isn't trying to look good and try to provide support? But you know what is annoying to me? Do it from your own profits. Why are you asking me for a buck? I just came in the store to buy dog food, and now you're trying to look good by saying how much money you raised. So I'm kind of giving you a negative spin on how some of this has really actually annoyed me a bit. Now, I like the way Target does it. They take their profits and they give 5% back to the schools. They generally don't say to me, well, actually, maybe they have, but it, for the most part, they do it on their own. They do it to the local. They do, and I like that. Anyway, it's a side note. I'm sorry I'm being a pain, but actually, that is a turnoff to me that each, every place is on this bandwagon <coughs> to some more support um, organizations. And I would rather see that they support it from their own pockets instead of trying to ask. Any thoughts on this? Should I shut up and move on? Ah, oh, it's annoying. And they, they're just doing their job, you know. Exactly. It's just really the customers. Right. Which I really believe as citizens of our community we all need to do what we can, and that might all be different for each one of us, to give back to our community. I'm at a place in my life right now, at 53 years old and three kids that are 29, 28, and 26, guess what? It's all about me. And so I have tons of time. But on the contrary, when there's someone that has a full gr group of kids at home, they don't quite have the resources I have now, energy, time, money, to give because they're doing exactly what they should be doing. So we all should be giving 
in the manner in which we can give. That's my own personal opinion. Now, I will say, I do income taxes. It's amazing how many people think they're poor and that I should just do theirs for free. And a lot of times I'll say to them, you know, I usually decide who I choose to be charitable with. <laughs> Got it? Moving on. Okay, so what do stakeholders need to know? <coughs> well, those who want to invest in the company, be it equity or debt investments, they want to know, is this real company really going to be successful? Bottom line. Now, it's nice and fluffy here saying they need to know the business model, the strategies, competitive advantages of the company. Bottom, what it, does it really mean? Are they going to be profitable? Are they going to make it? Are they going to be good? They're also going to want to know their assets. Remember, assets are resources owned or are controlled by a company with a future benefit. And they also want to know how much debt does it have? Because if a company has a lot of debt and it's going to be hard to pay it back, hmm, that might really alter or, or change their thinking on if this is a company they choose to invest in. Debt is obligations that will, will require a future sacrifice. I'm telling you some words you've heard in principles, but it never hurts to say it again. <coughs> Resources are benefits that are owned or op are controlled by a company that's going to last longer than a year. Debt is something that they owe. There's an obligation here to either provide a service, pay some money back, do something that's going to go into the future. They also want to know what the net profit or loss is. They want to see cash flows and how are these profits or cash flows, how do they look from period to period? There are many people that have great ideas and they say, oh, I'm making money, but can you pay your bills? You see, it's one thing to make money, it's one thing to have a great product, but are you getting the money in? Are you receiving the, the um, accounts from the customers? Can you pay the bills the next day? So you need to have an idea that needs to be great. You need to implement it. You need to have a, a product that can sell or a service that's um, desirable. But guys, you need money. Cash is king. It is king. Without cash, we go under. <coughs> so investors need to see you know, is this viable? Is this going to continue on to be successful? What do creditors need? How much equity is in place? What kind of capital is already within this entity or structure that has been given? Not in its loans, but that's been given as investments. Again, they also need to know assets and liabilities. Of course, they're gonna, it's important to look at various ratios, which we're just gonna talk about later in the class. Um, they're gonna want to see that it's in balance or within appropriate limits of their lending policies. And they're also gonna wanna see cash flows because ultimately, if they're gonna lend money, they wanna make sure they're gonna get that money back, right? And so these, this information is going to provide these investors and creditors with that necessary information to ensure that they want to be stakeholders of this company. Yes? Um, can you review what capital is in the way that we use it in the short equity? It's capital. Confusing. That's okay. No, I'm sure you've heard. No question is too stupid, just the ones you don't ask. <coughs> capital are the resources from investors that generally provide money as um, shareholders of the company in order to have an entity succeed. Now, with a lot of companies, there are 
various ratios of the amount of equity shareholders there are to the amount of debt that's leveraged for capital. But capital are those resources or assets, but equity and capital refer to ownership. Equity is ownership within the company, and those investors bring in money generally in order to invest in that company to provide financing activities, investing activities, and operating activities. There's, there's basically capital that's raised from equity and debt. A lot of times we will use bonds as a source to raise money for big expansion projects um, because we generally, they, see, they believe you get a cheaper rate of return. You know, to, to pay back that interest is generally gonna be cheaper than to give a, an equity investor a portion of the profits. So we'll, and it's all dependent on the, the success of the company and the interest rates, the, the e economy at the time. <coughs> so what do they need to know? Investors and creditors want to know, is this business going to continue and do they have money to pay us? Now, what drives the stakeholders' demand for getting this information or needing this information? They need to have the information just to make informed decisions. They have, we all just have so much money, don't we? We have so much money and we have plenty of opportunities in which to spend various, our, our limited resources, our allocation. And so this accounting information is used for investors to determine how am I going to invest? Do I want to invest in Coca-Cola? Do I want to invest in Target right now? Or would I rather invest in Starbucks? If the options are multifaceted, very open, this accounting information is going to help these investors determine which would be the better bang for my buck, be it a solid company, be it sustained, continue to be sustain of, sustained over a period of time. They only have so much money to give, unless you're Warren Buffett and he just gives to everything. The financial reporting process needs to communicate this information. Now, this is important. Information must be, know these two words, guys. It needs to be relevant and it needs to be reliable so they can make good decisions. Did I say no these two words? Information. Relevant. What is relevant? Compli uh, applicable. What's reliable? Dependable. Dependable. You can, valid, you can, you can trust it. Like, oops, I thought those assets were 10, mil 10 million. I meant liabilities are 10 million. <laughs> okay? Information needs to be relevant and reliable in order for people to make appropriate decisions. I can't tell you how important that piece is. And no, it, that, those those terms are related to information for investors. If our information isn't relevant, what's an example of not relevant information? Oh, there's a business operating in Red Wing that handles a half of 1% of the total resources of the company. Does, is it really relevant for one aspect? Reliable, oh, we produced 10,000 units this year. Whoops, I meant 1,000 units this year. Needs to be sure that we can trust it. <coughs> now we're gonna talk about, with corporations, those individuals who own the company are not generally those people who control the company. 
I have a small business. You make CPA. I'm a corporation. It's just called an S corporation because it's small. And there's just one shareholder, me. So I own it and I control it. But when we're generally dealing with large companies, that is not the case. And it's important to know that generally the people that own it have the equity in a company, absolutely do not control the company. Common shareholders and creditors provide financial resources by investing in and lending to the company. So these shareholders that provide equity or these banks or bondholders that provide loans to lend money, they are ultimately giving that money cash to help that company succeed. <coughs> but it's the company's executives, managers, and employees that really control the company. They conduct the day-to-day -day operations on behalf of the investors and the creditors. So can I go into Delta and say, look, I own 100 shares of stock. I want to know what's going on now. I don't like the way you're giving food and it's costing money. I want to change it. They would laugh at me. They have it structured to where their employees run the company fairly well. And it's a separate bond and link between the shareholders of the company and the employees of the company. Yes? If you own 51%, if you own 51%, you can't do that. But what you can do is you are on the board of directors. And the board of directors has a say in hiring the um, very top president and CEO. And so you will have control <coughs> as to the direction of who's running the company. Got it? So yes, 51% gets you on the board of directors and allows you to make the huge strategic decisions of how do we want to see this company go and what are we going to do here? So you have to make those decisions in that process that you're talking about. Well, basically what I'm saying is it's, a very, it's very separated with companies. Those who necessarily invest do not necessarily run the joint, okay? Per, I, I want to share with you a little story. I have a client who is a pilot for General Mills. <coughs> and they always hear what's going on. And they had the CEO and the, the CEO and I guess someone else up in management on board. And this is when all the Greek yogurt was coming in or starting to. And they made a decision. He remembers them saying, no, we are not going in that market. It is going to flop. All I know is they weren't Greek yogurt. And somebody's got to make that decision. Are we going to branch in Greek yogurt? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I don't really eat yogurt, but I know the Greek yogurt has like gone gangbusters. They chose not to expand in that market when everyone else did. Who made those decisions? That's the, these are strategic plans that happen with the head honchos. And they made a bad one on that one, didn't they? they're trying to come back. They're trying to come back. They're having a tough time doing it. They were not investors. They were the people that they were. They ran the, I mean, these were, granted, they owned a lot of stock. Generally, those people who are pr the CEO of the company okay. are very, very wealthy individuals. But um, they did not make the at that time, they did not make that decision to go into that market, and they have paid greatly for that because they lost a good portion of their revenues. So no, <coughs> employees and management run it, control it, but the stockholders own it. They're different. Problems can arise because of separation of ownership and control. Boy, isn't that the truth? Problems can arise because they have different visions sometimes, don't they? Investors, it's their money. They want to see a return on their investment. ROI, return on investment. What about the employees? They want to be treated well, and they should. 
and investors should want that also. But you, can you see how sometimes conflicts can emerge that can cause a division between those who own it and those who control it? Anybody have some ideas or comments on that or a story? Happens all the time. So <coughs> it's, um, it, it's really finding a balancing act with providing the employees with a good life and yet those investors ultimately have the investment, their money tied up in the company. Yes. Exactly. Employees with their money in their own company <coughs> and some of that concern. That's a really good point. And it really allows employees to fill in ownership within that company too. One thing that Sarbanes Oxley did, I'm telling you this stuff and this is just side notes. I might sometimes go off on tangents, but it will be interesting. You will remember it. <laughs> <coughs> How many of you guys remember Enron? Enron purchased an electric company out in, I think, Oregon. And at the time, these individuals had a ton of money in retirements because BP&E, I think is the name, and I can't remember what the word stand for, but it was an, uh, an electrical company that most of their employees invested their retirement into stock, and it was doing well. Well, when Enron purchased BP&E, they were strongly advised to invest 100% of their stock into Enron. So some of these employees who had 500, 700,000 in retirement left with nothing when Enron went under. So as a result of Enron and the pressure to invest in the 401k, into solely in the company, Sarbanes-Oxley, the SOX Act, came out with guidelines that companies cannot re require that anymore, which is actually a good thing, so there's not that pressure to put all your eggs in one basket, which is always stupid. But, you know, when this comp the stock is going up 2 and 3 and 400 percent, everyone wants to get a piece of the pie. But what goes up always comes down. Okay, the investors and creditors who provided financial capital own the resources but are separate from the executive managers and employees who have the day-to-day -day control of those resources. <coughs> this is a slide that provides you with a visual of this, this um, concept. There are principles and then there are agents. So in this respect, there are principals where, who might supply and own the resources and um, then have a, a bunch of us puny common stockholders and other people that are stakeholders of the company. And then over here we have the individuals who are running it who control it, who operate it. So there is definitely a separation between ownership and control. Know that. How are you guys doing so far? I'm going to 